The alarm goes off, and soon the cure is going to get started. You're going to get that the wonderful smell of coffee throughout the house. A wonderful promise that oh, it's going to be a good day. It's been a long week, but I'm awake, I'm ready to go, and I get to go and worship with my family. He gets to be edified by his word and sacrifice. It's going to be a good day. And then I go to get my kids up or my spouse. And they promptly grab the sheets, put it back over my head, over their head, and, and ask that question. I really have to go to church today. I'm tired. So, do I really have to go? It's even my birthday. Do I really have to go? It was going to be a great day. And then, of course, comes that questioning challenge. Do I have to go to church? And maybe it wasn't even your kids, or it wasn't even your spouse. Maybe it was you this morning. The alarm went off, and it wasn't greeting the day with a smile. It was rather hitting the snooze, rolling back over, and thinking to yourself, oh, do I really have to go to church? Do I really need to? Well, if it was up to the Pharisees, if the Pharisees were your parent, or if they were looking over your shoulder, and you would ask them that question, do I really need to pay? They'd go, absolutely you do. You need to go to church. Why? Because it's the rule. Now, to this answer, Jesus actually did not. He, he says that that is not the right answer. And by no means is he saying, you don't have to go to church. That's not what Jesus is saying. But instead, he focuses at the core of that question. He focuses at the very heart of the Pharisees themselves. See, for them, they you must go because that is the law. That is the expectation. That is what you must do. What about for us today? Today, when Christ has fulfilled that Old Testament law, do I really have to go to church? Well, the truth of the matter is, where do we find our true rest? It's in Christ. It's in Jesus that we get the best rest. And so for us to understand Jesus' response to those Pharisees, we actually need to put ourselves back at Jesus' time. They were ruled by the law of Moses. Those laws, those commandments that, that God gave through Moses to the people at Mount Sinai, Many of those laws that were given had to deal with their religious life. Those that we would call the ceremonial laws. The laws that dictated where, when, how, and, and why you gather to worship, why you do the sacrifices, how you are to do those sacrifices, how you are to pray, when you are very clearly how you are to worship. It also laid out those festivals that you were supposed to celebrate, expected to celebrate. It even shared exactly how the priests were to dress, and so on and so on. And one of those laws that was laid out is what we actually heard this morning from Deuteronomy 5, was that Sabbath law. That you would work your regular job for six days, but on that seventh day, on that Sabbath day would be a day of physical rest and a day to focus on the Word of God. A day to remember once again the promises that God made of, of a Messiah, one who was going to come and give you that spiritual rest. To remember how, how God had rescued them from Egypt. To remember God's wonderful promise of a Savior. And so now we have this Sabbath law in place, dictating how they were to worship, dictating when and where. And the Pharisees, well, they liked this, but they, they were turning all of the Jews back in, in, into slaves of 
the law because what they were doing was actually saying, this is great, this is wonderful, but to really focus, we need to add more rules to this rule. And they started to add some categories, some subcategories, even down to the point with how much you can actually do on this habit. Whether or not you can actually pull that thread off of your shirt, or even if you could climb a tree. But what was their focus? Their focus was so much on what I do for God. Instead of seeing worship, instead of seeing the Sabbath day for what it is, which is the blessing of God coming to us. So focused on the, the letter of the law of the Sabbath day with these Pharisees that when they saw Jesus' disciples picking some grain in order to feed themselves on the Sabbath day, <clears throat> They worked. They were not supposed to do that. All they were doing, they were walking along by the grain fields, and they were hungry. So what did they do? They picked up some heads of grain. They probably rolled in their hands to get to the kernels so that they could pop it in. They're harvesting. They're working. Jesus, how can you let them do that? Now, first of all, they, this was not stealing. This was actually in accordance with the Old Testament law. As long as you weren't taking a sickle and doing a full harvest, you could actually, while walking by your neighbor's grain field, you bring it to yourself. But they were holding so tight to the letter of the law that they missed the whole purpose and point of this beautiful rest. And so Jesus, in response to the Pharisees' question, he actually pointed them to, the, to Father David, King David. Back before he was king, when he was running for his life from Saul, he and his companions ended up at the tabernacle. They were hungry. They were starving. They needed something to eat. And the priest said, sorry, I don't have anything for you, except we have the bread of the presence. We have that bread, which was set aside and sacrificed to the Lord, put on the altar, and then the only ones who were allowed to eat it according to the law was the priests. And yet, what did the priests do? He gave it to David. And he ate. He gave some to his companions. He gave some to his men. And they too ate. Now, wait a second. According to the letter of the law, this should not have happened. This should not have been done. And yet, did God condemn them? No. They were in physical need. They were in physical need, and they were blessed. And God provided. In the same way for us when it comes to worship, God is providing for our physical need. Yes, but more than that, He's providing for our spiritual. That's why He went on to tell them, He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not for Man for the Sabbath. And so what does that mean for us today? Yes, no longer does God command us to go to worship. No longer does He command on how, when, or what. We, no longer does He command for our actions. But, He still, He still wants us to hear the word. He still wants us to regard it highly. To regard preaching his word as holy and gladly here and learn. That's what we do on a Sunday morning. We go to church. Important for us to not have a, a low regard for God because if we are, are skipping church because I'm tired, if we are skipping it because we think we don't need it, Jesus said to Martha, Mary's sister, Mary has the one thing that's needed. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, hearing his word, being edified by his word. She was receiving the one thing that's needed. If we choose that and, and decide that I don't need to go to church on a Sunday morning, I don't need the word, I don't need Jesus because something else is more important, We're sinning against God. We're saying that my, that my greatest need, it's not the word. 
It's not Jesus. And that's taking away from what God so beautifully is. When he introduced this Sabbath law, yes, there was a need for the physical rest. Six days you work and you get that physical day of rest. That's great. But more important than that was the spiritual rest. For the Old Testament believers, it's all about focusing on the promised Savior, you know, the one that they absolutely needed. And that's the one we get to look back and focus on, to focus on that rest giver, the one who gives us relief, the one who drives away the fear of hell, the one who, who gives us peace from a burden of guilt from our sins, the one who, who eases our yoke. Our burdens and struggles, who gives us true grace and mercy and peace, and that is only found in Jesus, the true Sabbath giver, the true rest giver. That's why Jesus so beautifully tells us, He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Only in Jesus, my dear friends, only in Jesus can we find true rest. Yes, the pillow can call to you and may offer you some a little bit of physical rest. But that's not what is great most needed. What is most needed is only found. Christ is only found here in His Word. And that's why we receive these wonderful blessings when we come to worship Him, when we come to church. It's not on those well, perceived needs of being entertained, of being intellectually stimulated. It's not all about that foot-stomping musical number. It's about pointing us to Christ. It's about pointing us to the one thing that we need. Him. The greatest rest that we have. That's why He gives us the Sabbath. That's why He gives us the opportunity to gather on a Sunday morning. Though physically we maybe don't feel up to it. Spiritually, it's more believable. Do I have to go to church? Now, if we're looking at that question in a legalistic way, like the Pharisees do, then we're looking at it the wrong way. But when we see that this is where we hear Jesus. This is where we get to put all of our sins at His feet. And we get to see our Savior on that cross suffering and dying for our sins. And we get to see that cross empty. We get to see that grave empty because He has won for us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. When we see Jesus as our greatest need, then, we're, then it's not a have to be here. It's a want to be here. It's a need to be here. To gather with brothers and sisters, to worship and praise Him, to be edified by word and sacrament, to receive His body and blood in with and under the bread and wine, to receive forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. That which Christ has given us, to give us true spiritual rest. Jesus.